Um, thank you so much, Annie. Welcome everybody to today's webinar on data storytelling, how to transform your data into engaging pieces. As Annie said, my name is Mafe and I will be your host for today. Sorry, I just have my presenter view, so I need to take a care, um, care of a few bits here. Um, in today's session, um, this may look like a short outline, but it's going to be jam-packed and you're going to get, believe me, a lot of tips on how to get started with data storytelling. We're going to talk about why data storytelling matters. Then I'm going to be showing you how to get started with data storytelling. Um, specifically, I have prepared a little starter kit to help you initiate with this. And then I'm going to share some extra magic on how you can bring your charts to the next level. And last but not least, um, some help and resources on how you can continue this practice and make it sustainable for you as well. So without further ado, let's start with a question. And the question is, what do we mean when we say data storytelling? Well, in a nutshell, it simply means to bring numbers to life by um, building a narrative around them and using tools like charts to showcase the insights of your data. It really is that simple. So it is the process of going from a spreadsheet or a bundle of numbers into perhaps something like this. So a first chart, a little iteration of what your data can look like, some of the trends, some of the patterns inside it. And last but not least, a clear chart with insights and um, a guide for your readers to actually take a look at the data that you're trying to showcase and a clear message to transmit. So now that we all know what data storytelling actually is, I guess the question is why does it matter? So why are we trying, why are we spending a full hour today going into data storytelling? Why is that important? Now, the reasons to do data storytelling are two sides of the same coin. First is that we are surrounded by data and the second is that charts are actually proven to have a big impact. So let's unpack that, shall we? When I mean, when I say that we're surrounded by data, I mean that working with data, it's no longer optional. Data is absolutely everywhere. And knowing how to correctly communicate the insights of your data is going to be a key skill in today's job markets in the future. And it's going to be a very powerful skill to have. And just to give you a scale of how much data that is and how much data is available for everybody to use right now. Here's a quote by Brent Dykes from his book, Effective Data Storytelling, great read and highly recommend. The volume of data is expected to grow 61% each year, reaching 175 zettabytes by 2025. Data has rapidly become a key strategic asset, shifting from a nice to have to essential at most organizations. And for context, one zettabyte, it's equal to a trillion gigabytes. So you can do the math and imagine how massive that much data actually is. Now, having this much information at your fingertips, why wouldn't you use it, right? That would be the main question. If we have all of this information available to us right now, why wouldn't we be using it to inform our decisions? It can be to drive revenue. It can be to tell the story of climate change. It can be to grow your organization. But whatever that is, you should definitely be using data. Should be using data, rather. Now, there are many ways of, for you to start using your data or for you to start harnessing the power of data. So why should we pay attention specifically to data visualization? And that's the flip side of the coin. So. Charts are proven to have a big impact. They're not only striking to look at um, and they're engaging when they're done well, but studies have actually proven how effectively they, how effective, sorry, they can be in persuading people. Um, there's one particular study conducted by Nihan and Reifler in 2017, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing those last names correctly, on whether the beliefs and misinformations could be corrected by the delivery of accurate information. So long story short, their study was interested in understanding whether people could change their minds about facts that were wrong and whether that had to do more with how the information was perceived or with their own beliefs. And this is one of the quotes from their findings. We find that delivering corrective information in graphical form successfully decreases reported misperceptions and a graph reduces misperceptions more than equivalent text. 
So this basically means they tested whether people would change their beliefs on subjects like climate change, or um, I think it was job security in the US by showing them a text with statistics, a text with actual and correct measures of the same figures that they were shown before and charts. And in most cases, um, but enough to actually make this a finding relevant for the study, for the study, they discovered that charts carried the most impact of all of the mechanisms, more than text with statistics. Now, working with charts and working with data on a daily basis is great, and I commend you if you're already doing that, but playing numbers and boring charts will get you absolutely nowhere. You need a story, and you are the right person to tell this story. When we talk about storytelling and when we say that we are all storytellers, we don't mean that you need to be a professional novelist. You don't need to be writing long essays or books or anything like that. What we mean is simply that you need to have a clear idea in mind and you need to have the tools to communicate this effectively and clearly to many audiences. So data storytelling can take many, many shapes. It's not just journalism. It's not just a report. And I have gathered a couple of examples here to show you what do we mean when we talk about data storytelling in all these different um, realms or areas? So the first example that I want to show you is actually a branding um, campaign that was done for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation by Pentagram, a fam really famous studio in New York. And they were trying to showcase the idea of gender equality. In this case, they created a whole brand identity for a philanthropic project. And I'm going to show you the video in just a second, but you're going to see why this is such a great use of data and narrative techniques to actually deliver a message. So let me go to the right screen right here. And this whole thing, it's based around the idea of equality and the plus sign. So how equality between men and women is important for everybody to achieve their goals and sustainability goals. And um, they visualized things like income and again, access to economic resource. And you can see how they repeated the same simple two rectangles, like a bar chart, or they even created like this funky area charts, but they went with one simple principle and they just extrapolated that to the whole brand identity of the campaign and created what I think it's a very powerful example of visual and data storytelling. Now, another example in a completely different field is the 2021 IPCC report, which included great charts showcasing evidence around climate change. And I specifically focus on the 2021 one because um, personally, I believe that it had one of the best collections of charts, but also charts that were very dense and information packed, but easily digestible by big audiences. I think everybody can understand, for instance, in here, how we are zooming in from all these observed temperature changes into the last couple of centuries, and then how we are seeing the trajectory that climate change has taken due to human action compared to only natural factors. So again, it's the simple things that really make your story land and that really create impact and deliver change. And journalism, obviously, it's a really great field to um, go for examples or try and see good practices around data storytelling. This is a story by Zeit Online and in another many, many, many other stories can work as good examples here. I just picked this one and it has a lot of good practices around repetition or the use of color and how we basically tie together all the different elements in our content, in our pieces to deliver a striking message and communicate with broad audiences. But hopefully these three examples convey the idea that data storytelling really can be found anywhere in many different fields and that you can use it um, in any field that you work at. So now let's talk about getting started with data storytelling. And for that, I'm gonna cover um, a little started kit that I prepared. So here you are, welcome. This is your storytelling starter kit and it's made of four main sections or areas. First, we have your data. And by these, I mean, this is the raw matter. This is your spreadsheets, your databases, wherever you're working with that contains the information you're trying to show. Um, out of the four, this is the only area that we at Flourish or Flourish as a tool is not going to quote unquote help you with because we are a data visualization tool, not a data analysis tool. But 
the data element of your storage kit basically means that you have data, but you also understand your data. You know it ups and downs, side to side, back and forth. You know what's the story hidden within your data. You know what are the insights in your data. You know exactly what you're trying to tell. And the process to get to this point of the starter kit would be your data analysis, your exploratory analysis, and your data wrangling. Then we have a conductive thread. This is going to be the core element of your story. It is the thing that ties, that ties it all together. Storytelling, and the reason why we use the metaphor of stories, it's because that's exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to go from point A to point B, communicating something. So knowing what's the common element that ties everything together, it can be a topic, it can be a specific finding, a figure or an idea, understanding that and making sure that all the elements in your narrative align to it, it's going to make it so much easier for you to tell your story, but also to transmit your message and for people to actually engage and align with the idea that you're trying to convey. And then we have charts, obviously, we're a um, data visualization tool amongst many other things. And charts are going to be, in this case, the primary tool that you're going to be using to transmit those messages. And as I wrote here, charts are just the tools to showcase the patterns that are hidden within the data. And what you need to understand and dominate here is just the different chart types and when to use each chart type to make sure that you are delivering as much meaning and value through your charts to your audience as possible. And the fourth element in your starting kit, in your starting kit, sorry, it's the charts, what I call the charts boosters. So these are narrative techniques that will enhance your charts and help deliver your story. This is the effective use of color. This is using text, having legends, symbols, using repetition. So perhaps um, using the same symbol to identify specific series and repeating that across your story to create that sort of link, that connective thread or conductive thread rather, rather within your narrative, and it's also visual metaphors. And we're going to cover all of these in just a second. So to put this all in practice, actually, um, you're going to have a sneak peek on our upcoming blog. We are currently working on a piece for the World Refugee Day on migration, migration trends. And I thought it would be very handy for you to see what does the started kit, the started kit mean actually in practice for something that we're actually building right now. So to put all those four pillars into context, I'm going to just tell you how each of them aligns to all the pieces that we have for this particular um, blog that we're writing. So for the data, we have global migration trends. We have European specific trends, and we also have a focus on Ukraine. And the process of working with our data and understanding our data meant that we did data analysis using Google Sheet and that my colleague Vanessa and I, who are working on this blog, had discussions to understand our data better. And once we saw the trends and once we got the insights, then we were able to go and find that conductive thread that we, that we wanted the blog to, to be guided by, so to speak. In this case, the conductive thread is the migration trends for the past year. And the focus is what is new and what has changed. And we have a specific angle, which is we are going from wider trends into a regional focus. Then for the charts, we have a wide selection of charts, but we focus primarily on line charts because we have a lot of um, change over time data. We have maps to highlight the location, scatter plots to do some correlation, multi-series charts for comparisons, and Sankeys for flow. And as for the charts boosters, we are graying out the noise. I'm going to explain what that means in a second, but that's basically we're highlighting only the series that we care to show. We're focusing on what we think people are going to be mo most interested in, or rather, what are the trends that are most interesting or striking in comparison with other years. We're doing some color highlights, adding meaning to specific colors and hues to enhance the story, while also adding annotations, etc. And now I'm going to break down each of the sections so you understand what this means uh, a little bit better. As I said, I'm not going to show you anything about the data because that um, it's kind of like the behind the scenes process of the charts, but I'm going to move on to the conductive thread. So in this case, the most important thing that you need to keep in mind when you're working or when you're in the face of finding your conductive thread is how do you tie everything together? And in this case, we just took a very normal, traditional approach of going from general trends, so from the big view of world trends over time. And then we split up 
into two specific trends in Europe for a local audience. And that's what the diagram right here is showing. So we go from the broader perspective of our um, data, migration trends, over, migration trends over time. We decided to focus specifically on Europe. And then we have a spotlight on Ukraine uh, because it is timely, because of the Russian invasion. And then we have another spotlight on arrivals in Europe and the UK by boat because that's topical and also it's very particular to the region that we are located in. A few things to keep in mind. Splitting your content makes it easier to cover. So having this structure of going from general to specific spotlights um, makes the piece flow better. It's easier for people to understand the different parts of the piece when they are clearly segmented. And it's easier as well when you're working on the charts because it allows you to sort of take them apart and focus on smaller chunks of data at a time. And that certainly makes the whole process of telling a story much easier. Um, what I mean by local advantage is that we are both living in Europe. We knew the European trends a bit more than, for instance, the trends in North America or in South America. So we decided to spin the angle towards that area so we could take advantage of our knowledge and then tell a story better. And that's absolutely fine. You might not be able to do this on every occasion, on every um, story or process that you're working with, but you know, playing it to your advantage and to the skills that you already have, it's always a good idea. And then the overall intention is that this blog is about quick findings and highlights. It is not in-depth. So Terry picking and choosing specific things to highlight um, was not an issue for us. It might be an issue for some of you, depending on what you're working on, but generally um, it's not a problem if you're suddenly finding yourself deciding to choose specific things or rather select what you're focusing on and what you need to leave aside, maybe for another time, maybe for another project. Now, the third element of our starter kit was charts and how to choose the right one. At Flourish, we've done multiple sessions on how to do this, but I figured that for the sake of storytelling, I was going to do a little bit of a recap and show you examples on how we ended up choosing specific chart types for this blog that we're working on. Um, but first, the steps on or the considerations you need to take when you're choosing a chart for your data are the following. The first that you need to select a specific aspect of your data for your chart. One chart cannot cover everything we wish, but it can't. So we really need to make sure that we have a clear message and a clear objective with our chart. And that is going to make everything easier. So once we understand what is that particular insight that we're trying to show with a chart, we need to know exactly what kind of data is that. Is it showing change over time? Is it showing flow? Is it showing correlation? And once we are clear on that, we would be able to then follow the rule of form follows function, which means that the use and the objective of the chart, it's going to determine the type of chart that I'm going to be using. And for that, the Financial Times Visual Vocabulary, it's a wonderful resource. It has many, 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 many chart types divided specifically by use and by the type of data that they are um, based on. And it will help you to understand which charts you can use in the future or for your data specifically. And there's a link to that in the slides and of course in the resources as always. And I just want to say that even though it's super important for you to know what your data is and what you're trying to show so you choose the right chart, um, there's no joy in a world that only has star charts, right? It's like once you dominate the basics and once you know, don't, not dominate, sorry, the right um, the basic charts or the traditional charts, you can always try and experiment with new chart types and just have fun with it and perhaps discover new charts for the same data that you would have visualized in the past, like a line chart or a bar chart. It's all a matter of experimenting and having fun with it. Now, in practicality, this is the process, for instance, of selecting this specific chart type for this specific data. So in this case, the insight is that five countries received 40% of the world's asylum seekers in 2022. The data was that I had was asylum requests by country, by region since 1975 until 2022. So we have change over time. We have a part to hold because I had the whole data set for the whole world. So summarizing, if I added up all my numbers, I would have 100% of the applications. So 
hence the particle relationship. And then we had comparisons because by having regions, I was able to compare how Europe compared to American uh, to America, sorry, in terms of the number of asylum requests that were received. And the chart type that I ended up choosing was the stacked percent area chart because it allowed me to show exactly those three things: change over time, power to whole, and with the color highlights, I was able to do a comparison between the specific countries that outperform all the others, those countries that amassed 40% of the world's asylum requests in 2022, and put them in context with the other regions. So again, this is a good example on how you go um, through this whole process, this whole storytelling process, to make an insightful chart that tells something to the audience. Now, another example, and these were charts done by my colleague Vanessa, the insight here was that Italy, Slovenia, and Croatia saw the biggest increase in arrivals in Europe by vote in 2023, in the first quarter. And the data was top first arrival countries in Europe, data over several years, specifically by, by quarters. And in this case, she decided to do two different chart types with the same data. One was to showcase the change over time through the line chart with the little highlight on the series. You can see here how she used an accent color to specifically highlight 2023 and the outperformance compared to the previous years. And then to highlight the geographical dimension, she then built them up. So again, another good example of how the same type of data can lend itself to different visualizations depending on your objective. And these two charts are perfectly adequate, perfectly acceptable, and they're just, um, telling a different story. And that is the whole point, right? It's like how you can tell multiple stories or different stories effectively using charts. Now, let's move on to the charts boosters and how do we make concepts and ideas stick with a few tricks and tools. So as I said, um, color, use of text, repetition, and visual metaphors are the four areas that we're gonna touch on here. What I mean when I say the use of color intentionally, I mean having a color palette with meaning. Even if you're constricted by your um, branding guidelines, within your branding, I'm sure there are going to be colors that on a specific context can lend themselves to be more meaningful than others. So if you have a shade of green and you're working with climate change data or forest data, tree data, maybe that's going to be the most ideal color. Or if you're working perhaps with... Um, the notion of danger or risk, maybe a shade of red or anything that's more warm can be a really good idea um, to use that color for that specific chart. Then the highlights, highlight, highlighting your story, sorry, with color. What I mean by this is actually dialing back on the color and only using color when you're trying to specifically give meaning to certain areas of your story that you're interested in the public to understand. And then we have assign color to specific elements. And I put repetition because here what I mean is maybe you assign a particular shade to a specific series and then use that throughout your whole story. And that is a visual cue that your audience is going to pick up and they're going to subconsciously see it in all the charts. And I'm going to show you an example on this in just a minute. Then we have the use of text as a guide. And this means using descriptive titles, adding legends, adding annotations to your charts, adding footnotes perhaps with further clarification or even instructions on how people should read your chart or should consume your chart and add color to your text elements. So there's a little bit of an overlap there between color and the use of text. This can be using smart legends and that highlight the name of the series with a specific color. It can be adding specific blocks of color to your headlines. And these are all things you can do with Flourish. And I have links in the resources um, to specific tutorials on how to docs to achieve those results specifically. Then we have repetition. In this case, I mean using the same symbol to refer to the same element in different charts and the same chart with variations. The same chart with variations means that perhaps we are building a story or we are literally plotting the same data over and over again with slight variations to highlight different areas of the chart and make it easier for people to see the nuisance and to see what are the changes that we're trying to show them. And last but not least is the use of visual metaphors. If you've never heard of visual metaphors, we are just trying with this type of narrative tool to give new meaning to things that we already know to enhance some area of our charts. 
And this is all going to make sense in a minute. It's very murky and very abstract when you explain it like this, but I have examples that hopefully are going to make this concept land for you in a second. So an example of using color intentionally on our upcoming blog was this particular scatter plot that Vanessa built. Here, the topic is migrants crossing the channel in small boats. So she was plotting the frequency and when were the migrants crossing, where were people crossing, when were um, the sightings. And in this particular case, she said that she used blue because she, she thought it was fitting in terms of crossing the water. And she made the dots more opaque, so they are more in the background. So what she's saying there, what she means by opacity is that these dots are actually quite low in opacity, so they just go into the background. And that's, again, a narrative technique of like trying to drive the user to different areas of the chart at different times and different paces. So if everything was opaque and everything was like super saturated, the user would be very overwhelmed. So by adding a little bit of opacity, we just make sure that everything is more readable and we make it more digestible. And then because the topic is water, she's talking about crossings by boat. The blue was a really good shout because it aligns with the meaning of, or like the idea that we have of water, which we associate with the blue color. It's a very small decision, but it really goes a long way in tying it all together and creating meaningful experiences for our users. People are more likely to remember things because of little details like this. Now, the use of color intentionally, and this is what I mean with assigning a specific shade to a specific series and using that through your story or through your piece to create that sort of dialogue between all the charts and your audience. So um, as I mentioned, we have a bit of a spotlight on Ukraine, specifically where have Ukrainians asked for asylum in Europe. And for that, I added a special color. I just designated one of the colors in our palette to Ukrainian refugees, and it was this um, purple. And I not only chose the color because it was quite bright and it was part of our branding colors, but it actually similar, like to me, gave me a little bit of a wink to the Ukrainian flag, which is a darker blue with the yellow. So it might just be a little bit symbolic. People don't necessarily have to catch that meaning, but I know that that was the decision behind it. And then um, I made multiple um, charts with the data on Ukrainian refugees. And I repeated intentionally the same color and I only used it for Ukrainian refugees and none other charts on the story on the full blog use the same shade because I really wanted it to be exclusively designated for this particular series and data point to make the concept really, really um, land for people. And again, if I'm really going into the nitty gritty, you can see or well, I'll explain this to you right now. Only the countries where the majority of the refugees or the asylum requests were done by Ukrainians are highlighted with the same shade. So anything that is gray means that it was either, you know, countries that only receive applications from other nationalities or countries where even though Ukrainians had a big chunk of applications, like for instance, Germany, they were not the majority. And again, these are the little things, the little decisions, the details that make a chart more effective than others and that make concepts land um, much better. Now, moving on to the use of text. This is a really clear example of annotations and how they can help bring your story forward and make your chart make more sense. In this case, um, Vanessa here was showing migration trends over time and where do migrants or refugees come from over several decades. And then she highlighted specific crises or specific conflicts that may have explained why the increase or the decrease in the number of migrants. So you can see here how the number of refugees coming from Myanmar um, spiked right after the start of the Rohingya crisis. So again, smart de small decisions that then go a long way into making our charts more impactful and easier to understand for people. Um, repetition on the blog, we're going to have a couple of maps and because the topic lended itself to it and because there was not a conflict, we've decided to use the same symbol. We're both using bubbles instead of spikes, which you can do with projection maps uh, to keep it consistent, right? To make sure that all the maps are kept within the same realm and within the same um, aesthetic. So not only is the base map for both maps the same, but we kept the style of the bubbles quite similar as well. Um, we, again, we're both using circles instead of one going for spikes and one going for bubbles uh, to keep it all consistent and on brand. 
And these are two completely different maps. Um, she was mapping the first port of arrival and I was mapping the comparison between the total number of refugees or asylum seekers for a country and which percentage of those was um, came from UK, from Ukraine. And now we move on to visual metaphors. And this is what I mean when the, the concept of visual metaphors is gonna land when you see a good example. And we didn't have any examples on our blog actually, so I had to um, outsource them externally. So as I said, visual metaphors are basically trying to repurpose the meaning of something into our charts or rather using an element that has an external meaning that people can understand and use it to enhance the data in our particular chart. So the title of this actual project is the simulated dendrochronology of the U.S. Migra migration between 1970 and 2016. And try saying that three times, uh, it's quite hard. Um, so this project, which I have known for years and it's actually very interesting, it's plotting migrants or immigration to the U.S for um, this particular number of years. And it's trying to resemble a tree trunk. So if you've ever seen a tree trunk or a tree cut, you can see how you have the rings and the thicker or the bigger the rings means like the older the, the tree. So in this case, they're repurposing that visual cue, that, that image that we all have in our brains of a tree trunk to showcase the passage of time. And then they're also showcasing migrant groups. So the color of the dots represents the region the migrants are coming from. I believe yellow is Latin America. I think pink might be Middle East or Southeast Asia. And I think green is Europe, if I'm remembering correctly, on top of mine. And every ring is a decade. So every time you see a white strike means we're moving on to the next decade. And what this is showing overall is this idea that at the beginning, oh, and the direction of the dots means um, when were the migrants resettled in the U.S. So if it goes more in the south, it means that they come from more from America and Latin America. And you can see how that happens to be the thicker ranks on most recent years, whereas Europeans were resettled in America earlier in the day. So around the 19th century and so on and so forth. And again, it's a really powerful um, mechanism to use when, when you have the tools, when you have, you know, when, when the stars align and you find the perfect concept that lands or that aligns perfectly with your data and it's able to simply make everything feel much richer and you can tell how this it's a much more powerful message than just a simple line chart or a simple area graph we could have showed the same data you could have seen the same migration patterns but in a different way I'm not saying it's the best way. Definitely some contexts lend themselves to simpler charts and some were more complex charts, but relying on visual metaphors um, can really be a powerful way to convey your data or tell your story. And another example that might be more perhaps easier to grasp or easier to relate to is this grid of bar charts plotting rain patterns. This was post, um, published by the South China Morning Post. And it's one of my personal favorites, historically, it's one of my favorite charts um, out there in the wild. And basically, this is simply showcasing the rainfall, the daily rainfall, and the little triangles correspond to typhoons and monsoons. So um, I think the author here was plotting the correlation between maybe the rainiest days in Hong Kong and the that monsoon season and the presence of a typhoon. And the visual metaphor here is that instead of doing the bars grow upwards, as we're all used to, they all grow downwards. And if you actually look back into it, and this, I think, was published in a full spread, so it was quite a big chart and like a, a big page, it looks like dripping water on a window. Like you can definitely see how each row just looks like a little waterfall. And because the topic is water and it's rainfall, um, it's a pretty well executed visual metaphor in my opinion and as well I think the bubbles here represent yes the annual rainfall and combined with that idea of falling rain it almost looks like little puddles and again these are very 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 small details these are and just like tiny decisions that one can make in their chart making process but that in the end they do go a long way and they pay off quite a lot so before I go into extra magic, um, Annie, I'm just wondering if there are any questions in the chat or in the Q&A that I can um, address right now that we are halfway through our session. 
So we've just had one question come in in the Q&A about visual metaphors, if you just mm -hmm. want to give that a go at answering. Um, so it's just asking, is hand-drawn illustration the easiest way to go with visual metaphors or is there a tool in Flourish that would let us tweak existing pictures to suit the message? Mm. Um, so there's no tool in Flourish that natively is going to give you, provide you with a visual metaphor. Definitely it's a matter of, you have to do the heavy lifting there. You have to be the one assigning that meaning to that specific um, concept. But I mean, in terms of hand-drawn, um, I guess, illustrations, uh, they're, they're, they can be a really good way of achieving specific maybe style. I wouldn't be so sure as to saying whether they would um, create the visual metaphor. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that you can do visual metaphors with Flourish. For instance, um, changing opacity or maybe rethinking a chart that you've done in the past and just kind of like giving it another go and maybe playing around with colors a little bit or changing the template. So if you're very used to perhaps um, doing stack charts for part to whole, maybe you can give a go to hierarchy and working with bubbles or even a tree map can, you know, those little changes and experimentations may enhance the meaning behind your chart. But I think it's very depending on the data and the topic. But I'd say hand-drawn is not the only way to go. And yes, that within Flourish, you were able to achieve the visual metaphors, but I'm not sure if that answered the question. Um, thank you. And we also have another question just yeah. asking about the tools that we have used to create these charts. Mm. Yes, sorry, I am dehydrated. So I'm just taking a little bit of a water break there. Um, everything that you've seen so far and everything that I'm going to be showing for the next slides is done entirely with Flourish. Um, so far, I've not used any particular like tricks or hacks or nothing that is not out there in the open and there is a premium feature that I'm going to be showing but it's going to be very clearly labeled but if it's not labeled otherwise everything is completely available for you um with Flour within Flourish right now as it stands okay so let's resume and now let's go into our extra magic so so far I've given you the basics these are the four things that you need to carry with you in your toolbox whenever you are trying to or trying to practice data storytelling but obviously we couldn't leave the session without giving you some tricks to enhance your charts even further so the first bit of extra magic is filters and flourish is really good at this we have different options for filters you have drop downs multi-select or in this case just simple buttons and the good thing about filters is that you can pack much more information within your charts if you rely on a filter to guide the user and make sure that they can choose the different views and understand the data a bit better. In this case, this is an example that is showcasing two sets of charts. Sorry, I just have like a little bit of a bar up here. Let me, there we go. Yeah. So... There we go. So if I click on the first button, increase from 2022, this is going to show me all the countries that saw an increase in the number of migrants arriving to their coasts in the first quarter of the year. But if I go into decrease from 2022, I'm going to see the five countries that saw a decrease. So again, instead of showing you perhaps, I don't know, 40 countries with all this data, I'm simply showing you the top five and I guess the bottom five based on a specific metric and by using and this is what I meant about graying out your data by using our color overrides option within flourish which allows you to color a specific series by specific color you can see the highlight on 2023 which is the point that we're trying to make and you can see the context grayed out in the background um, that is the other years another example of extra magic would be time sliders. Time sliders, you can achieve them within different templates. Linebar Pi has them, for instance, and in this case, we're showing them in projection map. And again, it's a really good alternative to change over time when perhaps rather than actually seeing the evolution in time, you want to see in this case, um, the evolution, but with a geographical approach. So again, this is the um, number of migrants arriving to specific countries like their first port of arrival in the first quarter of every year and if I click play there we go 
So we can see, I, I know the data, so I know that Italy has grown quite a bit, but with the chart, it really lands how that bubble increased considerably. And then Slovenia and Croatia are also two countries that saw a big increase specifically in 2023. So again, the chart makes it very, very evident. Now, more magic that we can use within Flourish is to harness the power of stories and animations. So most of our Flourish charts come with native animations from when you go from one series to the next, when you apply a filter or maybe remove one series through a legend, but animations can also be enhanced by stories. And if you've never heard the term stories before, stories are simply a way that we have to bundle charts together within Flourish. You're able to create a new story and you can add as many um, charts as you want and they would go as sort of like a slide deck. And we can tell this is a story by the little navigation on top right here. So in this particular example, and I've shown this chart quite a few times in the session before, so you're familiar with it. Um, the whole point here was to showcase the general migration trends over time, highlighting that 40% of migrants have requested asylum in specifically five countries around the world, like top five countries. Now, if I use the stories and animations, I'm able to tell an even richer story. In this case, I'm focusing only on Europe because three out of those five countries are actually located within Europe, which is quite starking. And then all I did there was I reduced my, my series number, right? I focused from the whole of the world until just Europe, Russia, Germany, and Turkey. And the animation there does a really good job at guiding the user into the story, right? It's like really looping them in and dragging them in and understanding what, what am I trying to explain? And then even further, I'm able to add a couple more series to highlight that five countries in Europe account for mo most of the asylum requests from the previous year. And the last bit of extra magic that I wanted to show you today, which is the only premium feature um, in all of the demonstrations that I've done here, is our scrolly telling in app editor. So this just launched last month and it works very, very similar to Flourish Stories in that what you do is you bundle up your charts together and then you create a scroll based experience without any code, which is quite starking if you know how scrollies are generally made, they are quite technical. So this is really going to help people do them very, very quickly. But here, the value, the added value is that it is the user that's controlling the narrative entirely. Like the next chart doesn't appear until the user scrolls. And there's like a physical connection almost to the story because you have to move physically through it to see the next charts appearing. And to bring everything together from all the areas that I've touched up until now, I'm starting with a like grayed out version that only introduces the topic and says five countries in 2022 saw 40% of applications, but then it goes into a more detailed view of those, what those five countries are, and then highlights a single one, there we go, and then highlight another, another one, and then I move into a next chart and so on and so forth. And well, this is going to loop endlessly in the presentation, but um, scrollies can be as complex as you want them, they can be as long as you want, and they can really drive the experience forward for the user and make sure that the concepts um, all land. And of course, we're going to have resources. Well, actually, almost there in my resources slides. There we go. Um, these are just a few of the ones that I've compiled when putting the slides um, together. I might add a couple before we send out the um, the deck at the end of the week, but these are just some of the articles or help docs that I think are going to help you create wonderful data-driven or data storytelling pieces. Some of these I mentioned on this session, some I did not mention, but I think are going to be quite instrumental. But as always, you can check our help center or training center, previous webinars. We always, always create our charts thinking about that fundamental idea of data storytelling. Um, so hopefully from all of the training resources and educational resources that we have, you would be able to enhance your concepts of data storytelling even further. And that has been me. Um, thank you so much. Now I'm passing it on to Annie, who I believe has some announcements. 
Hello. Um, just wanted to check in. Are there any more questions from anyone? Please do drop them in the chat. If we don't have a chance to get around to them now, we will get back to you. Um, you can email us or we will answer you later. Um, but thank you so much, Mafe. That was amazing. Um, and just to let you know, very sadly, this will be our last webinar for a little while as we are taking a break for the summer. Um, but don't worry, we will still be putting out loads of great content um, on our blog and on our social media. So make sure you give those a follow so you don't miss anything. Our handles are up on the screen now. And thank you so much to everyone for listening. We will be sending out an email in the next few days with a recording of this webinar. Um, and if you do think of any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask or get answered today, um, you can reach out to us on these email addresses on the screen. So yeah, thank you so much. And we will see you when we are back in the autumn.